welcome to my cellar. As you can see, I've taken down the destroyed old set, <laughs> the hanging, and Jim and I are going to work out something to do with a green screen in the back, but that hasn't happened yet. And who knows, the cats may come down. That other green light you see over there in the corner, that's a fish tank that I'm draining. Uh, anybody in the area wants to come get a uh, 20 tall, that's what they're called, 20 gallon tall as opposed to long and low. Uh, let me know. Now, th this first one, I believe I meant to answer this on the last one. I'm, I can't remember that I did, and I looked over the thingy that I wrote, you know, about what I talked about, and uh, I didn't see it. So if I did it, I apologize. I'm going to talk about it again because I've had more time to think about it. And also, I didn't get to make comments to talk about tonight. So uh, I'll be... Uh, oops. My microphone is slipping. There we go. Um, don't have a lot to talk about tonight anyway. So it's about the village of Hamlet. And uh, I play tested that. And it's in, in the, the comment goes, features a small village which follows a druidic faith in a recently constructed monastery devoted to a singular god. This strongly resembles something Irish villages would have faced during the 5th century. I can't... I've read this thing a couple of times, and I don't remember what I've talked about. Do you know of Gygax? Intentionally modeled Hamlet after this area, and if so, would it be safe to... Early D&D &D was assumed to take place in real, albeit a fantastical art. Well, let's look at this question a little bit. And um, before D&D, &D, nobody had created a world out of nothing to play in. Um, we all had to start somewhere, and uh, believe me, a lot of us very early, a great number of us very early DMs had a very medieval uh, European slant to our games because that's what we had to draw on for inspiration. Uh, Dracula movies we'd seen, uh, bad, bad Italian movies with with bad dubbing uh, that we'd seen, um, sword and sandal uh, movies from it, mostly from Italy, the Levantine Hercules movies and Son of Samson's and all these kind of things. And so, yes, it did. And Gary had an interest, uh, a, a scholarly interest in Druids. Uh, <laughs> nothing else. He was a, a very... Uh, uh, he, he was a, pra a very practice, a rigidly practicing uh, Jehovah's Witness when I knew him. Um, and so um, he, he had uh, studied, you know, when, when the Druid MPC came in as an MPC, ho, 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 um, all the levels of the training and everything were in there in the names of the levels. All right, and so it, cons it, it it coincided a lot with what was known of as the uh, religious practices noted and known as classical Druidism, and so uh, yeah, Hamlet had that. Uh, there there's some really good uh, fiction, fantasy fiction. Um, some of the early stuff involved um, priests or abbots of the old faith and conflict or harmony less often with the new faith and so a lot of authors were patterning authors were patterning 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 their stories using those bits of history so yeah uh, certainly hamlet was uh, a little time capsule of that period and can be looked at uh, I play tested the character, uh, the Druid of the Grove, who became known as Drew, and um, I was very much into the Druid stuff and um, at odds with um, uh, pushy people of the other faith. And a pretty natural uh, dynamic for that period of time. Um, 
we're going to try another um, later on. We're going to try another link. Um, I, I tried to send the, I tried to use this link before. Uh, Jim had problems with it. I went back and looked at it today. It's working, so I'm going to uh, try to uh, put it at the end. It's just this really cool animation. This guy sent me. He said, "Hey, look at this," and I think it's pretty cool. Um, okay, here we go. More 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 contemporary stuff. Story dice. What a tool. I advise using non-fantasy themed ones, though, as they work best by contrast, and less theme related they are. Oh, the less theme related they are, and better and newer the ideas. Uh, Honored to be read by me. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you sent me a comment. And, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, using the fantasy dice that have the dragon and the sword and the castle and all that, that's too easy. Especially if you're practicing making a hook. Because you don't have to adapt anything there. You can just take a known fantasy element and spin it into a tail. Okay, it's good to be able to do that. But it, it's much better for your brain and for your ad lib skills. And believe me, you, you, you gotta, you got to be able to ad lib to some degree or another to be a, a good, successful uh, dungeon master. Um, if truth be told, anybody that's played in my Wheel of Blame Blame Wheel of Blame games, <laughs> I'm having a little trouble tonight. I should have st stuck myself earlier to see if I was done baking. Well, tell you, and that in my Wheel of Blame, it's about eighty-five percent ad lib because of the nature of the game. They they challenge me with things too. And so, if you use non-traditional, you know, don't use the fantasy ones, you might still get a ghost one. Um, but if you have two or three sets in the bag and you pull out three or four, chances are, in, in any event, the good point, it's too easy using the fantasy ones. Use the other ones. Adapt. You get one that's an automobile. Well, it's a chariot. But adapt. Adapt. And it's just a mental exercise that I think will help you um, when we, it's an axiom in life, but even more so in gaming, weird shit happens. Well, you'll be less likely to stand there flat footed going if you've got a little ad lib skill under your belt. I mean, I ad lib these things every night. I cut and paste the questions. I read them as I cut and paste them. I print them out and I go watch TV for an hour and a half. Or I play train station or, or seaport or something like that. Um, ad living, you can learn to ad lib, ad lib better. Can't do anything for bad lips. Um, was Gandalf, a Gandalf, Gandalf, whatever, however you think it ought to be pronounced. Was he a copy of Merlin's image? Today, if you show up a, a picture of a wizard, few would speak of Merlin, most would say it's Gandalf. Well, okay, why is that? Well, in the last 25 years, that image of Gandalf the Gray and Gandalf the White has been burned into the public's consciousness. So if you go, wizard, especially the non-fantasy gaming players are going to, you know, if they went and saw the movie, that's what's going to pop into their mind. Now, for the older uh, among our crowd, or the younger who got hip to the movie Excalibur, well, it's an entirely different image, him running around with that silver skullcap thing, thingy on. And... While the story is great, I had a great deal of problems with that movie because of the silver skull cap. Okay, I could have bought that, but their uh, stainless steel chrome armor um, was over the top trying to portray their virtue and their, their wonderfulness. But anyway, in any event, um, if um, 
say at 15, I had heard the, the, the word wizard. I certainly would not have conjured up uh, the guy from the, uh, the Hobbit movies. Certainly not. Um, because I hadn't seen him. I don't know what I would have conjured up. Probably a black and white drawing out of, a, out of an old book or something that I had read uh, about medieval history or something like that. Um, Gandalf was supposed to be some uh, other race of, of super long-lived beings. Uh, Merlin was here and then he wasn't here and then he might come back again and you know a pretty long-lived dude um i think maybe um tolkien might have used merlin because certainly merlin was the best known widest known uh practicing magic user because of the once and future king and, and, and all of that and to remember Tolkien's English and Arthur and Merlin are English legends so Gandalf was probably patterned after him but okay um, the, the people that are interested in this thing know that if it doesn't add to somebody's enjoyment that fact what difference um okay <clears throat> here we go i don't know if 3e was only created just for money i think it was inevitable when a new company buys dnd in the current edition 2e is was selling dismally and being overtaken by other companies well whatever okay maybe to we was me i i'm not hip to the uh facts and figures of the sales i'm not a fan of 3e personally but i don't think watsy really had a choice but to do major revisions and put out another edition you might be right maybe so however how does that explain 3.5 or 4 I'll go on. Magic was bringing in so much money, I think 3E was created not to make money, to keep the brand and game alive. That's very perceptive. That very might, well might have been a, a, a big chunk of why and how it was done. But what it was the rationale for 3.5, which for many years was called the edition that shall not be named, because it was such a piece of crap. And four, which was just a steaming turd on a hot sidewalk crap. You spend the entire night fighting six orcs. Oh, yeah, that was what we did all night. By the time I'm 46, I might make fourth level. Um, what was that rationale? But I think the, some of the same greed that TSR experienced, some of the same trying to cash in. So, you know, maybe 5e was inevitable to save the brand. It has, certainly. It's certainly different. As long as 5e players are having a good time and calling it D&D. I'm okay, because when you look up D&D &D in a good Wikipedia listing, you'll find my name. Okay, now this is a, sort of an apology, dude, or an explanation slash whatever. In regards to my comment, you read about whims and preferences. I realized if it was, I paused if it was unclear. I was agreeing with you. By whim, I wasn't referring to your desires as a DM. Two met Dragonborn or whatever. I was more referring to the player who decides they want to play something wild and crazy, knowing they're playing in a DM's game that doesn't have those, and feels entitled to have it because it appears in a rule book somewhere. 
<laughs> we'll stop there. Yeah, don't you love those people? Um, now, I understand when that I when I say it, it has a little more of a cachet. But I've always played my world, and that's the way it works. And if I don't want something in my world, ew, no, that doesn't exist here. Because it's my world, and I want to. I, I really want to be able to to treat everything equitably. And if you insist on bringing, or if you want to insist on bringing in a character or a class or subclass or something that I really don't like, I'll be honest with you, I'm probably going to, I won't say fudge, but I'm going to go, I'm likely to very subconsciously just, when it comes to an either or, I'm going to do or. Because, screw you, I don't like that Dragonborn anyway. And I pick on Dragonborns for a couple of reasons, but mainly because they're one of the more ludicrous extremes. Um, <laughs> and somebody I know plays one. Um, yeah, don't, don't, don't try and do that because I don't care what it says in somebody else's book or another book. When you sit down at my table and we and they ask, "What are we playing?" I say, "We're playing." O slash first, meaning original, slash that that period right in between the two, as O had reached its glory, and first was just taking off right in there, frozen in amber, that's where I play. Because it has the most latitude, the most pliability and flexibility. Um, okay, now we'll go on to the next part of his comment here. I was referring to those DMs who have to control everything, even the players, usually through heavy-handedness and unfair rulings. The DM who punishes players for not following some predetermined, predetermined story the DM wants. I was not referring to DMs who don't allow Dragon Boys, Tieflings, or whatever, because as my first comment stated, it's a DM's world. Okay, yeah, it certainly clarifies. And, no, a DM shouldn't. See, that's just it. I wouldn't want to subconsciously punish somebody for playing a character class that annoys me. With the exception being the paladin. They annoy me, but I never punish them because that's their purpose. And when I'm setting up one-offs for people, oftentimes having a paladin as one of the, uh, the pre-gens is uh, kind of like uh, it can be fun, and sometimes you can use the paladin and keep the other players in line, and you don't have to be the bad guy. You just look at the paladin and go, does that fit with your views? <laughs> then watch the shit hit the fan. Um, Alright, thank you very much for enlightening us on the way the Dragon and Adventure Gaming were put together. The old old guard methods that you described are familiar to me from some long haulers and graphics departments I've met over the years. Quite a lot of hands-on labor, but it was a, it a, has a certain charm. Oh, certainly it did. You you put that together. You assembled that magazine hands-on. Now, if you've got a feel for graphics and digital and whatever, you you can do the same things. But we didn't have that, and we had that feeling. Amid the razor cuts and the wax burns, when we were done, put that baby to bed, send it to the printers. Um, I make comics the old fashioned way. I've used Letraset, Bendade, Bendry dots, and scraped razor blades through blood spot inks to stimulate, simulate rain, etc. And of course, all that lettering with the old, good old Ames lettering guide. Good times. Though, in fact, most of it was terrifying, but you get used to the adrenaline from fire, for constantly fi fixing fuck-ups. Um, well, um, little known fact, um, when, when um, uh, Phineas Fingers was late, 
Um, it was often because uh, JD, he was on deployment in the, in the Navy. He was a Navy pilot. And uh, there are a couple, three of them, where I did all the lettering with a crow quill pen. And uh, it was the scariest, most nerve-wracking thing I ever did because I didn't want to screw up Phineas. But if you look carefully, you can, you can see the little skinny... Uh, okay, chest and cheats. How do you feel about treasure chests that aren't what they seem? Do you go in for the bait and switch? Or is it not really kosher to dangle a treasure chest in front of the PCs, only to bite their hands off because it's secretly a monster? Well, that's not something I would do a lot because after you do it once, everybody's going to be a whole lot more. However... I think it would be perfectly reasonable, for instance, for a bitey chest, um, if a if you had uncovered the the fabulous horde of Alibaba and his forty thieves, except Alibaba was a dabbler in magic, and he had boxes and crates of all kinds of stuff, not just monetary stuff, but spices and and fine tableware, whatever. Certainly, a guy like that, to protect his hoard, would liberally scatter those kind of chests around in there to catch the unwary. And they'd probably be the most enticing-looking chests. Pick me, pick me, pick me, they would seem to scream out, however that would be. That'd be fun. <laughs> Run, run through a warehouse, literally a warehouse full of uh, chests that can eat your fingers. That would be fun. Um, but I wouldn't do it all the time. You know, it'd make a once, make a once in a time memorable adventure. All right, question two. Warding XP for treasure. How did you deal with this mechanic? I didn't believe in it. First off, the original apportionment of treasure with Gary's system for shares based on the levels is like a goddamn pirate crew. Captain gets so many shares, the first mate gets so many shares, and common semen, you know, etc., etc., etc. Plus, even, even way back then, it seemed to me that um, having read some of the novels, or short stories mostly, that these things, these, you know, treasure chests full of, you know, treasure hoards and that came from, that they didn't have to do a whole lot of long time do this, do that, go there, you know, whatever. And having found the mounds of treasure didn't make them any better except richer. So I never really bought into that. However, if you found a hoard, certainly there'll be a, a monetary amount for having found the point because this is XP. XP is the things that keep you alive longer, tricks you learn, things you absorb. Finding an enormous tre treasure trove of silver does not teach you how to fight better. So I was never a, that I was never a, a proportional uh, something certainly. But not cer certainly not some of the original uh, methodology. No, never, never bought into that. Um, that was a fun thing that Gary and I talked about many, many times. And the old uh, philosophy was: you play the game the way you want, and we did, and I did. That's the way I played, and um, I was more about, uh, I, and I, I certainly wasn't about counting up orcs 
for EPs. Now, again, I'll quote Jolly Blackburn and the Knights of the Dinner Table. You see little marks aside off there. How many EPs is a, is a, is a lamb worth? You know, or something. Because uh, those guys are all about killing things and counting the points and, and leveling up. Well, okay. I was more about, um, wow, that adventure went really good. Everybody gets a thousand points or, or whatever. A number that I would, you know. But the funny thing is, the group in Carbondale, we kind of had to remember to level up. Now, I know that sounds really bizarre and, and, and funny to today's running to level up uh, play, but we were having so much fun that it would, it would be a couple, three, four sessions. Oh, hey, what do you know? We ought to count up EPs. Except we call them XPs. And uh, Jolly calls them EPs. And um, I, I had awarded them at the end of every session. I had written it all down. So then everybody started adding up what they had. And uh, it was, you know, it wasn't all just, everybody didn't get the same amount of everything um, every time. And there were other reasons to, uh, 50, 50 points for that uh, smooth move that got something off your back, you know, or whatever. Again, I always looked at experience points as being the tricks and trade and, and fitness and um, sneakiness and whatever to avoid the fatal blow. So we then, you know, oh wow, I went up a level, yay! Oh, you know, and, you know, and um, we didn't train back then. Third level, you fought as a third level. Next adventure, you couldn't level up in the middle of an adventure, but you could level up after it was over. And the next one, we went and played at the new level. I mean, wow, big deal. Instead of a third, we're a fourth, or a second through a third. But that was a big deal then. Just like surviving a uh, um, uh, dungeon crawl funnel game, where you go in literally with a stack of character sheets already filled out with names, and having one alive at the end, and, oh, I have a character now, there's a lot of similarity to that mindset. All right, next. Okay, let's see now where we go here. Um, all right, rewarding rarity of treasure items rather than straight value. Well, I always have. It's just the way I approached it. Um, if if the chart said it was worth seven thousand gold pieces, then I assume because seven thousand gold pieces is, was such a huge amount of money back in when you were a, a first level or a second level, I assumed that it was a great work of art or the lost. And I always, I almost always made up stories about whatever it was, you know, or gave it a name or whatever. Um, I have forever and ever have given weapons that have pluses to hit or pluses to damage that are not magical. They have no magic. They're just exceptionally fine steel or exceptionally well crafted or it just was made to fit your hand. You can justify anything like that and um, still have a whole lot of fun. And it doesn't have to be magic. But then you've got to remember it's not magic when you come up against something that can only be affected by magical weapons. But, by the same token, if it has a plus one magic blessing thing on it, but its damage is still, you know, many points because of its keen edge or its fine steel or whatever there's a way to get around that as the dungeon master all right um let's 
Let's see, what else? And he wants to know, does, wouldn't that make it fun divvying up at the end and possibly sending player against player? No, it wouldn't be fun. And um, <coughs> from the sound of this, you expect to have some sort of list of inventory of the crap that you pull out of some mansion or some long-lost uh, cave system or something like that. Um, it was, you know, haul out to this, haul out that, who's carrying what, get out, get back to the tavern, the, the secure camp, the cave, whatever, and then go over all the loot you picked up and the things you picked up and things you're not sure if they're any good or not. And I always had things laying around, some of which were good to have, magic or whatever, extremely handy, and some were just things. You know, I was, I think for a while I was putting out cream pitchers. And uh, cream pitchers would continuous water, a quart of cream. Good if you had cats chasing you. I, at least in my world it was. Um, I would find weird things to put out in. But anyway, that was just me. Um, that's about it. Um, I have a Patreon for those of you who have subscribed. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who haven't, think about it, please. Thank you. I'm always trying to make make a better video here. Um, if you don't subscribe to this, please click that button. And let's see. I have no con no conventions until next March. Wow. What a wonderful feeling that is. We're experiencing this really bizarre weather today, the November 3rd. My wife and I were out, and we sat down on a bench in front of uh, Dairy Queen in our shirt sleeves and had an ice cream. It was like 74 degrees or some ludicrous um, uh, temperature for November the 3rd in Cincinnati. Um, beautiful day. So, hope you're having great weather there, too. And I'll um, talk in again next week, but only if I get more comments. I'm going to be working on the uh, D20 Delving game coming up. And I'm going to try to get this link to you um, and make sure it works. I mean, it worked for me earlier. If it, worked again, if it works again for, my, for Jim then you'll have it at the end here and go check out this guy's really neat little uh, video thing that he put together. And until next time, do not go be. Hello, and welcome to my song. Who wrote about the dungeons Now he's the feller Live from the cellar Talks about D&D And old school RPGs Still quite a feller A curmudgeon in the cellar Last man round When the race went down Calling Gary In that Lake Geneva town Hey Gary, it's an awful mess Let me edit, we'll have success D&D &D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D &D and old school RPGs, but he's still what the feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. Brought psionics to the game to attack that wizard's brain. DSR and Fantasy, collection of micro armory, tight with tramp under a tree, high as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons, now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D &D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. 